Hey, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman, and my very special guest today is Dr. Tammy Nemeth, uh, a brilliant expert on the energy situation, both uh, really in the United States, Europe, and globally, uh, and my fellow podcaster on the uh, Energy Transition podcast. And uh, I thought it would be great to have her on the show to to just talk to her one on one and get her views of what's going on, all the crazy stuff going on in the energy space right now. Tammy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I, I love your podcast and it's an honor to be speaking with you today. Well, it was an honor for me to do yours uh, recently as well. So I, I really appreciate it. And it's been, uh, I think we have a great collaboration going with with uh, Arena and Armando on the, on the other podcast. So Let's let's keep it going here today. Um, let's start just uh, you know by by spending a couple of minutes talking about you, what your practice is, uh, how you came to uh, spend so much time analyzing and talking about energy, like I do. It's it's kind of a crazy thing to be doing, but uh, it sure is interesting, isn't it? It sure is. Um, I started out researching in Canada. I did a PhD at the University of British Columbia, where I focused on uh, Canada-US oil and gas relations. I've always been kind of interested in the, the decision-making and policy-making process. You know, what informs uh, policymakers' decision-making? You know, where are they getting their ideas from? What about policy entrepreneurs, agenda setting, all this kind of thing? and in particular, how it relates to the oil and gas trade between Canada and the United States. Because as we all know, it's a very integrated market, hasn't yeah. always been that way, but it, it, it evolved. And there, there was always this tension. And so I looked at this movement, this the up and downs of trying to get a continental energy agreement. And in reality, we got that in the free trade agreement with the yeah. energy chapter, which has since been reformulated. But um, for a long time, it was it was this disconnect between when Canada wanted access, America didn't want it. Then when America wanted Canadian oil and gas, we didn't want to sell it. And so it was it was this <laughs> this sort of interesting tug of war, which uh, eventually culminated in the in the energy chapter of the free trade agreement. So that was what my research was for my PhD, and I did a lot of um, archival research in the United States. I went to all of the presidential libraries from Eisenhower through Reagan went to NARA in, you know, in Washington, went to the Department of Energy, and they were extremely kind, let me look at all kinds of documents, which was really fun, um, and did a lot of Canadian archival research and so on. And then in the middle of writing my dissertation, my husband got a job in Europe, and we moved to Europe. <laughs> so then it was, okay, I'm living in Europe now, but my focus has been on North American energy. So I expanded my knowledge because a lot of North American energy, of, of course, is rooted in what's happening globally. So then I started to look more at what those interconnections are for the for global oil and gas, looking at the geopolitics of it, and the sort of evolution of where that has gone over the past 40 years. Um, we've lived in four different European countries over the past 20 years and um, did a lot of traveling. Um, I had children, so I decided, made the conscious decision to focus on raising my children in foreign lands, so to speak, <laughs> um, and, and not so much on, on the academic work. I still try to produce an article every year or so, um, and then I was a guest lecturer at a university in Germany uh, doing special uh, talks on unconventional hydrocarbons, and particularly the oil sands and looking at, they wanted to know more about the regulatory structure in Canada, because a lot of the discussions in Europe was that it's the wild west in Alberta, and they just go <laughs> right. do whatever they want, and the poor natives and everything else. And so trying to set that record straight, and it was actually very eye opening, because the students, after my lectures would come up to me and say, so how much are you getting paid by the industry? And I said, well, I'm not, not getting anything. I'm just explaining how this how the system works in Canada. And they didn't want to believe it because yeah. they'd been sold this other package of goods from Greenpeace that and this was a bit shocking because we lived in a little village, maybe 20,000 people in Germany. And um, Greenpeace was 
in the town square every weekend, every weekend, either talking about the oil sands, about how bad it is, or um, explaining how um, a trade agreement with Canada would be bad and just, you know, the usual stuff, right? But it was, it was shocking to me that they were out there every weekend, every yeah. weekend, they had yeah. volunteers spreading pamphlets and so on. And, and then I was asked to teach uh, a course on um, the geopolitics of energy and the environment. And that was really fun. And I really enjoyed doing that because I got to bring in some of the history and then look at how it's affecting policy decisions, you know, the Paris Agreement and so on. Um, and then I was offered a full-time position to teach a full course loads and we moved <laughs> to another country. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So um, during that time, my husband was traveling a lot and we decided that we would try to spend more time together as a family. So I decided to just kind of step back and just do my own little research. And then I was asked to provide a research um, paper for an inquiry that was going on in Alberta, the province of Alberta in Canada, about the um, the campaign against the oil sands. Just yeah. kind of situate it, who's behind it, who's involved in it, what are the, the bigger implications of it. So I wrote one report and then they asked me to do an update because COVID had happened. Um, the Build Back Better meme was going around everywhere. Everyone was doing it. And so then um, the, the commissioner of the inquiry asked me to do another paper kind of explaining how all of this could be related or whatever. So I did that as well, um, which, of course, garnered all kinds of negative attention from the usual uh, environmental activists who were taking issue with who I was or whatever. Um, and so since then, I, I, I consult. People ask me for my expertise to, to provide research and analysis of what the trends are doing and the sort of intersection between energy security and geopolitics with the growing movement of environmental social governance. And so that's what I'm kind of doing right now. And at the same time, I'm currently working on a book about the, um, the ESG movement, where it's been, where it is, where it's going. Oh my goodness! What a what a fascinating subject that is! Holy cow! We could talk all day about we that. We could talk alone. all day about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, and so you know, it's so interesting to me, and uh, I think that's that's one of the reasons why I was so glad you were uh, willing to join our other podcast, is because you have this focus on this intersection between politics, geopolitics, and energy, which which most people, I, I, I think, so many people don't understand what an enormous impact public policy has on where and how we get our energy right i mean everything is driven by public policy uh, you talk about the oil sands joe biden's first act as president was to cancel the keystone xl pipeline and one of the main rationales for canceling that pipeline given by the the radical left-wing environmentalists here in the united states was that we want to keep the oil sands in the ground, all that oil in the ground. Um, has canceling Keystone XL reduced production from the Canadian oil sands? Not at the moment, but the, yeah. the problem is that w there is very limited export options. It ends up going right. by rail. So even if right. uh, without, we had built the pipeline up to the border, which is what is so terrible, you know, just needed to connect it really. Um, to some extent. But yeah. um, the, the problem is that there's the East Coast is blocked by Quebec. Quebec says no pipeline shipping Canadian oil sands oil can go through their jurisdiction. Um, on the West Coast, we've got the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which was right. nationalized by the federal government because the regulatory environment was so terrible that the, the company that owned it said, oh, we can't afford this. It, it, just the cost overruns. We have Coastal Gas Link, which is the only one that was was approved. There was uh, several others in the pipeline. Another one had been approved, and then the the at the last second they pulled the license for it. But Coastal Gas Link is in massive cost overruns because the activists go through go in there and they sabotage things. And last year, while the the trucker convoy was going on, there was a massive attack where they destroyed um, millions of dollars worth of equipment, threatened the employees. 
And the RCMP, who supposedly always get their man, still have no suspects of a course. year later. Yeah. Right. So it's like there's there's this um, malice it, it, uh, in the environmental community against oil and gas development, period. And yeah. so it's like what we talked about yesterday on the transition podcast, you know, it it when they complain about carbon capture or they complain about this or that, the whole the whole end game is to keep it in the ground. So right. and, and the goalposts will always be moving. So even if the the companies end up with really good carbon capture technology and it works a hundred percent, they would come up with some other Oh, sure. Some other thing, you know. And as, as we talked about yesterday, what, the main reason why the environmentalists oppose carbon capture is because it, it can have the impact of, of allowing the oil and gas industry to continue to exist, right? They're not opposed to it right. because it doesn't work. They're opposed to it because it works. Yeah. And people don't understand that either. Um, anyway, moving on to, to current events. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess first let's let's talk about BP. BP announced its earnings today, record earnings for 2022, just like uh, Shell and and Chevron and ExxonMobil, although a smaller dollar amount, uh, 27 billion compared to Exxon's 55. Um, and, but in the, the process of making the announcement, as I read it, and I'm, I'm interested in your view. Uh, as I read it, what BP's main promise is, is that they're they're going to slow down on reducing their equity production of oil. They had previously targeted 35 to 40 percent reduction by 2030. Uh, and in today's announcement, Mr. Looney is talking about more in the 20 to 30 percent range. Uh, is that how you're reading that as well? Yeah, I I think the the issue here is that when they pulled Russian oil off the market, something has to replace it. Yeah. And they, there's only so much, I mean, the Middle East is problematic in many different ways, right? So you <laughs> have- It has been, yes. You know, be, to be <laughs> kind, right? And, and so other companies have to step in and there's a lot of development that's going on in Africa and in other parts of Asia and so on. And, but they want these- um, trusted companies to fill that gap until yeah. their transition is further along, I guess. That's that's the mentality that I'm sensing from it. Um, and so therefore they can't move as quickly because th I think the, the idea was that the Middle East and Russia would fill that gap as they wind down the operations of the Western private, you know, or publicly held companies. Um, versus so that eventually the state owned companies would have the control. Yeah. So if you look at what the breakdown is for um, the oil and gas production in the Middle East and so on, it's state owned companies and China state owned companies. So you don't see much criticism of their operations going on. It's really only the criticism of the publicly held companies and to sort of phase them down, phase them out, however they wish what terminology they want. Um, but now the whole Russia thing is throwing a monkey wrench into it. And they're, yeah. they're gonna need trusted suppliers. And so that's my reading of, of why they're saying, well, we're gonna slow down our, our phasing out. But I think there'll, there, there'll also be difficulties with the ESG requirements. So um, the EU has just introduced their enormous ESG thing, which is 16 different documents that companies are going to have to take into account. And um, they, they based a lot of it, they worked in conjunction with the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is doing their thing, which they're hoping to introduce by, by June of this year. Um, and that requires taking the oil reserves as um, a liability, really, because <laughs> you have to count the emissions not just in your proved reserves, but in the probable reserves. They yeah. were having this discussion last month. And, and I'm thinking, how are you going to estimate the potential emissions in probable reserves? You have no idea if right. it's, you know, if you can produce it. But that, they so want much of it depends on the advancement of technology, right? I mean, uh, precisely how much is really a reserve counted as a reserve. Right. And even if you're using that oil or that natural gas, what 
it's, do you get to take into account that I think it's going to be you carbon capture is going to take all those emissions. So my emissions of potential, if I have to take in scope one, two, three, maybe it's zero, maybe it's net zero. I mean, yeah. so how, how are you allowed to do that, that calculation? It's uncertain at this point. Well, I had to laugh out loud last week uh, because the SEC in the United States is, is going down this same path. <laughs> and the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission last week uh, told a reporter that they've been taken aback at, at all the concerns <laughs> expressed from the industry about this crazy road they're going down. And, and he seemed sincere in that, right? I mean, uh, it, it seems like, and the guy's name is Gary Gensler, and he's a, he's a real radical uh, retread from the Obama administration. And, um, you know, and, and for him to say they're surprised that the industry is concerned about all of this fantasy stuff that SEC wants them to be somehow quantifying uh, as part of their annual reserves reporting is 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 just ludicrous. I mean, it's just it, it's like these people actually live in in this imaginary universe uh, where everything they're doing actually makes sense to somebody and. Um, it, it's just bizarro uh, when you when you actually read what they say and, and watch them actually uh, actually watch the clip of him talking about all this and just it's my well, it's a bubble. It's a bubble yeah. because this is one of the things I'm writing about is that so the, when the ISSB had their comments, there was 700 comments. They had two different documents and there were 700 comments per document. So, and they were pretty much the same criticism, right? Yeah. But so the big four accounting firms, the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, they helped draft those documents. Then they submitted comments supporting the documents. <laughs> oh, we think this is great. It's like you helped write it. <laughs> of course you think it's great. And then that get, gets held up in the discussions. Right. Well, the it's investors. It's authoritative and, source, right? Yeah. Right. Is that they were really supportive. You know, many, <laughs> many comment letters were extremely supportive of what we're trying to do and so on. And so to their credit, they did try. They talked a little bit about the critics. But if you look at the, the, the critical comments, it was from the preparers. But it was sure. like, yeah, preparers are a little bit upset. But the investors really want it. They like, well, okay, well, why do the investors want it? And they, they had a webinar where they were talking to Richard Manley, who's the chief sustainability officer of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Fund. And he was asked, why do we need this? And his answer was so unconvincing. And he gave this ridiculous comment that, well, when Milt Friedman came up with his point about shareholder capitalism, there was only Three billion people on the planet, but there's eight billion now. Okay, so how is that related to why you need this, <laughs> and how does that affect whether or not a business is is a good investment or not? And then he went on to say that, well, you know, we're we're using the financial accounting from the '40s and '50s, and we just we can't wait a hundred years for something better. So we need to move now. I thought. That is the most ridiculous argument I've ever heard. It, it really wrong? is because the financial accounting from the 40s and 50s is the principles of accounting. I know. Developed <laughs> by certified public accountants who are experts in the field of accounting. I mean, <laughs> instead but of a bunch of environmentalists. But it's not good enough, apparently. Not good yeah. enough for today's society. And well, they course, need something faster now. Right, because we live in a fantasy world and, and principles, you know, kind of mitigate against having principles mitigates against the fantasies and and it, it slows progress, of course, uh, down this this road to, you know, what's ultimately seems to me is going to become kind of a, a train wreck here in just a few years. I I wonder about you. I So I asked Dan Jurgen the same question when I had him on recently. And that is just, what is your view of the progress of this energy transition? Uh, are we really on a pace to uh, get to net zero by 2050, which is what it's all supposed to bring about, right? Are, are we meeting the goals um, to, to get to that particular target, do you think? 
Well, that's a good question. And I think a lot of it depends on what are the goals? Because <laughs> they seem to shift, you know. Well, they do. Um, yeah. And what bothers me is that if they want the net zero they're asking for, it necessarily means, and this has been written about by several experts who are consulted by governments, um, that our standard of living will change dramatically yeah. for the worse. So if you think that high food prices, um, high mortgage rates, high fuel prices is a feature, not a bug of the net zero transition, <laughs> then yes, absolutely. I think we're on, the, uh, on that pathway. Um, I don't know at what point people will resist and say, I don't wanna live like that. I like my standard of living. Um, I don't think that having to pay so much for fuel and being worried about heating my house is uh, an appropriate thing that our government should be doing. And I've had conversations with people and they said, which Western country is actually operating in the national interest of its citizens? And again, I look at Canada, question. not in the national interest. I mean, we have all the resources you could possibly want and we don't want to do anything. We just want to keep them in the ground. You know, right. it, it's like, we're going to keep oil and gas in the ground, but then we're going to go import rare minerals from China because our environmentalists won't let us dig in, um, in Canada. It's the same thing like all the mines that have been, um, you, the leases have been withdrawn by the, the federal government in, in Minnesota, I think was one. Just recently, there was a huge copper deposit and they were right, the, looking the twin to... twin metals mine, yeah. Right, right. And so that was recently you know, kiboshed. So who then are we dependent on? So we're swapping one form of dependency onto another. And for Canada, we never had that dependency in the first place. You know, we could be completely self-sufficient in sure. oil and gas, but we make decisions that that make that more difficult. So. Right. And we, we have that same situation in the United States, of course. I saw a chart yesterday that that was just fascinating to me. And it's it's a chart that's uh, being circulated by the apparently the lithium industry, projecting a sevenfold increase in the production of lithium ion batteries by 2027, four years from now, we're going to septuple, not double or triple or quadruple, but septuple the production of lithium ion batteries in four years. And that of course means a corresponding increase in lithium supply. Um, that seems like a fantasy to me. Um, I, it just seems completely out of the realm of any reasonable possibility to me. Yet that is really the basis for all these projections of uh, mass production, you know, exponential increase in the production and sale of electric vehicles. Is, I mean, does that sound like a reasonable, attainable goal to you? It depends on so many factors, right? Yeah. I mean, it depends on get, sourcing the lithium because that, that's not an easy thing to do. Then it's the right. processing of it. Then it's the manufacturing of those batteries. And where are they going to be made? They're certainly not going to be made in Western Europe. I mean, no. the UK... No. That their battery factory that the government had put a whole bunch of money in is not going to open or do anything because it's too expensive. Yeah. So it's all going to go to China. And so now in the news here in the UK, they're talking about how, when do we get to buy Chinese electric vehicles? We need them in this market, you know? Yeah. And it's like, well, why? Why would you want to? So now it's not only outsourcing the production of those batteries, it's outsourcing the production of those vehicles. And, you know, it's, I don't, I don't see how that that's possible unless it's offshored somewhere else. Now I know that China, I thought had just cut a deal with, was it Chile or one of the, the large lithium producers um, in South America? It was, um, oh my gosh. Uh, I'm forgetting which country, the, the lithium triangle countries. Uh, yes. Um, was it Uruguay? Um, I can't remember which country, but yes, signed a, a national <laughs> they signed a huge deal. contract yeah. with CATL, a Chinese uh, lithium miner, to develop their lithium resources. Now, 
the, the irony of that is, is that the lithium triangle is a big target of the Biden administration to establish <laughs> friendly supply chains, non-Chinese supply chains for, for U.S. lithium supplies. And I'm sure the European governments have been targeting it too. And now yeah. we see, oh, it was Bolivia. The country was Bolivia. It was Bolivia. 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 Okay. Bolivia. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, that's right. Yeah. So, but, so we want to do all this mining. We want to source the supply where it's independent of China, but of course the Chinese companies move in and they're going to be mining it anyway yeah. and, and processing it and so on. But I, I know that in Canada, there's some moves to um, extract lithium from uh, oil and gas wells and it, because it's in the fluids and it's come up and they're, they're, testing different technologies to do so. But with these, and I hate to go back to the ESG stuff, but with these new requirements, um, they one of the big things throughout the whole, the whole ISSB thing is water use. Mm -hmm. And processing lithium takes a lot of water. A lot and of water. A lot of water. So if you have a Western company that will be bound by these standards, the investors and banks will be looking at the line and saying, oh, your water use? Sorry, we've signed on to a biodiversity pledge. Um, you either have to reduce your water use or we can't invest in you. Right. So, and the same thing with the mining. Any type of uh, mining, depending on what it is, it requires water to process things. So <laughs> it, yeah. it's like we're, we're creating these roadblocks for Western we companies to actually do these things. And it's also the time. Uh, I mean, even so there's two ways to extract lithium. It's either through strip mining uh, from hard rock or evaporating it right. from, from salt water and brine. And well, even the, the evaporation projects take years to, to start up. You know, once you've identified the project, it takes you years to make a final investment decision and then more years than that to put in the infrastructure. And then it takes three years to have your first production from the evaporation process. Just evaporating it is a period of years. So to think you're going to septuple global production of lithium in, in the next four years is is just it's just it's it's like a Walt Disney cartoon or something you know it's just it, it can't happen in the real world it can only happen in some study at some university as far as I can figure out you know uh, conducted by people who have never had to function in the real world right and I, I and I have nothing but respect for university professors but but your models don't reflect the real world. They just don't. And uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I, I <laughs> but see, that also goes to what Dan Jurgen said to you about copper, right? Because it's not yeah. just lithium that's required for all of these different things. The lithium ion battery is one part of it, one component. We're going to need so much more copper and we're going to need so much more cobalt. And it's like, okay, yeah. so where are we going to get this from? We, and this goes back to a study, I don't know if I mentioned it when we chatted on my podcast, but the Dutch government had commissioned a study back in 2018, where they said, okay, what, what's the mineral resources that we're going to need to do the energy transition? And so they went to one of the big technical universities there, they produced this study, and they basically said, there isn't enough in the world just for us. <laughs> I mean, we'd have to corner the market on everything, like on copper, on lithium, on cobalt, on the neo and, and all these other things. We're going to have to, just for us, for Holland. And it's like, so now you have competition with how many other countries? It's not just Holland. It's not just America. It's all of the different countries now competing for the same resources. So they want to say that wind and solar is, is cheaper than oil and gas. Well, not if everyone's competing for the same materials to construct them. The, the prices will go yeah. up. And then there's the maintenance issues, as we saw with the the earnings reports of the of the wind companies, you know. Oh yeah, so, let's talk about that. The Siemens Gamesa thing, where they report a billion dollar loss in their their wind industry or their wind investments, and and their answer to it is, what was their answer to it? I'll let you say it. <laughs> <laughs> we what, what was it? It was we need more government. Um, was it 
what was the word that they used? Was it, it was intervention so or anyway, they want more subsidies, basically. More right? subsidies. Yeah. 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 And, and <laughs> you know, we, we've already enacted hundreds of billions, if not trillions in subsidies for the wind industry. But now we need more because now they we can't need more be profitable. Well, um, Vestas, the big Danish um, wind uh, manufacturer, had posted a 1.2 billion euro loss yesterday. Holy moly, I didn't see that. That's crazy. Yeah. So Siemens Gamesa, which has now been uh, bought out by Siemens AG. So they've yeah. they've paid out Vanguard and BlackRock and everybody else. But <laughs> the what's interesting is that if you look at who's the shareholders in Vestas, BlackRock, Vanguard, <laughs> right. uh, Amundi, and and Nor the Norwegian uh pension fund or whatever. So it's like all the same people are investing in the transition and losing money. So it's a good thing that BlackRock also holds significant investments in Exxon. This is probably the only thing that's allowing them to stay in the black. Well, I guess it may be. You know, Larry Fink is very fond of bragging about uh, all of his firms, BlackRock's uh, fossil fuel investments, but only recently, of course, since various <laughs> Republican states started uh enacting penalties for, you know, discriminating against their energy co companies. Um, but I, I just, I, yeah, you know, that whole aspect of this with these, these big investment houses um, having invested in all of these companies that are now losing business. And it just seems, it all seems so unseemly to me. Siemens is a German company that's over a century old. I mean, it's an enormous company that goes, way back has existed forever and for for that company and a co you know companies like that to be saying well we took these incentives and these subsidies and we went and made a big loss and now you need to intervene and uh, intervene and help us with more tax incentives and more subsidies really seems very unseemly to me um i just it it leaves a really bad taste in my mouth and I, I just wonder, of course, you know, most people don't read this stuff and don't know about it, but uh, you just wonder how long that particular grift, which is what it is, can be really sustained in the Western world. And and is this same thing happening? Are the governments of Asia uh, enacting programs like this to, to the extent that the Western world is? That's a good question. Um, I don't think so. I mean... If you look at Sri Lanka, they're the <laughs> the poster child for how this yeah. all comes crashing down and doesn't work, right? When yeah. they decided to go complete net zero, they were going to go organic farming, no pesticides, no fertilizer, no herbicides, nothing. And um, they their production of agricultural products, which was their main export, just dropped and the people were starving and they they the president fled with his life kind of thing, you know? So it's that happened really fast. I just, the problem for the West, I think, is that we're moving very slowly. It's like the frog in the boy in the hot pot, right? It's slowly <laughs> right, heating yeah. up and we're slowly moving in that direction. And it, it, it hasn't reached cataclysmic stage yet. But I mean, the Asians, if you look at, um, I think you had mentioned India in, in, in something you sent me, and how India is is pursuing coal, yeah. And and they said uh, we're also going to increase our natural gas use, and right. we're happy to buy from Russia because we're market based, and Russia is the cheapest thing out there, of course, right? Because no one else can buy yeah. it. So um, why not? You know, we we talk about um, capitalism and so on, but. Uh, it's we're certainly not acting like it, not in the Western world, when you have so much um, government intervention, which creates nothing but market distortions. And so unfortunately, what, what I'm concerned about is that we have pension funds that are investing in the transition that are supposed to be at arm's length from government, and yet they're pursuing ideological government-driven policy agendas where they should be looking at what is is this the best investment? for our citizens who have entrusted us with their hard-earned money so to ensure that they have some kind of pension in the future. And Canada, for example, we've got combined provincial and federally 
$2 trillion in debt, which is insane for a country like Canada. And the bulk of that has been since Justin Trudeau has been prime minister. <laughs> so, and, and you can't just use COVID as an excuse because they were well on this way right. before COVID, but yeah. it's just made it worse. And it, if I feel like, you know, on, on TV shows, when they have that, that little thing that shoots out the money, I feel like they have <laughs> right. one of those and they're just shooting it around. Just Here, you need gun, some money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Well, I, I'm afraid we have actually run over time, but I don't care. Um, I, I guess let's sum up. Where do you think this is all headed? I mean, is it, is, you know, my view, of course, is that there's going to be a big train wreck at some point where these limits on minerals and, and other limits uh, related to renewables and EVs is, is just going to cause a major energy crisis. And then that's at that point, you know, the Western world may reevaluate some of this, but I wonder where you think it's all headed. I'm kind of a catastrophist myself, so you have a cooler head than me. <laughs> I don't know. I try not to be the catastrophist, but it's like, if you look at our direction of travel, what is our trajectory? And our trajectory seems to be going along the lines of destruction of our standard of living and way of life. And when I was talking with Francis Menton, he said, I, I hope it comes fast. I hope it comes quickly. I hope that California doubles down and is even really super stupid to hit the wall. So people see it yeah. because not enough people see it. And until people see it and push back and say, no, you know, there's power in saying no. And I don't hear like the, the oil industry in Canada doesn't say no. They're afraid, you know, oh, we have to deal with these regulatory bodies it's like well at what point do you just stop just say stop yeah. <laughs> this isn't for the best uh, of of humanity it's not the best for our people it's not the best for our citizens and if i could just bring in because i had mentioned yesterday octopus energy and i did a, a little bit oh, right. more research yeah. on that <laughs> and so canada pension plan it has invested $300 million in a company that brags about never having made a profit. And they bought out this um, energy supplier called Bulb or something that had been, um, went into administration during the energy crisis here in the UK. And the government had bought it. And so I think that they, they went and did a whole round of investment donations, really, I would say, <laughs> in the summertime. And Canada Pension Plan ponied up $225 million for it. And they went and bought this bulb energy. And um, they said, yeah, we're probably not going to, we've taken significant losses this year, but it's really important that we keep growing because eventually it'll pay off. Sure and, it will. and I'm thinking every, every year you're, you're asking for more cash, more money. Then it kind of reminded me of Twitter because Twitter was losing money every month. Yeah. And so how is that sustainable if they were losing money every month? I, no, Elon so, Musk just said the other day that they finally gotten to the break even point now since he took over, which, you know, is good, I guess. I guess. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so they're, they're investing all of this pension money into a scheme, really, that seems dodgy and that Al Gore is a significant investor in his generation investment fund, whatever it's called. What's it called? Uh, right. Generation Investment yeah. Management. So <laughs> ironically, Al Gore invests the money on behalf of the World Economic Forum, which is investing in this <laughs> octopus energy, which is also sucking in Canada Pension Plan investment money and bragging about never making a profit. So is that where our energy transition is going? that you have all of these entities that don't make a profit and eventually need to go into administration and be run by government. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, your, your comments about people are going to have to say, stop reminded me of, of William F. Buckley uh, who founded the conservative journal, the national review back in the 1950s. And one of the most famous things, he was just a really eloquent, well-spoken guy. One of his most famous uh, statements was the role of conservatives in American society is often to stand astride the flow of history yelling stop. 
And as, as I heard you talk about that, it's that's what's ultimately in the Western democracies is going to have to happen or, or it's just going to be, at least in my view, a big calamity. And, and I would hope that we don't reach that point because so yeah. many people are going to suffer and for what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're not, it's not like we're displacing fossil fuels. Uh, we, we burned a record level of oil, natural gas, coal, and even wood pellets last year yeah. to generate energy. So what is it we're gaining from all these trillions of dollars in the subsidies and incentives? Tammy, we're out of time. We have to stop. <laughs> but I really enjoyed this. Let's do it again soon. Um, and and thank you again for agreeing to participate in the Energy Transition Podcast. I, I really thought this week's uh, edition was the best we've ever done. So you're a big part of that, and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. It's great fun to be on the Transition Podcast with Armando and Irina. And yeah, thank you so much for, for including me. It's great fun. It is. It is. Well, that's all we have for today, folks, for the Energy Question. Uh, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you.